Hello and welcome to the Brian Voice. I'm Randy Seaver. Today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 9 verses 1 through 13. I'd like to read that passage for you before we begin. Beginning in verse 1, Paul writes, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Verse 6, but it is not as though the word of God has taken no effect. That is, it is not as though the word of God, the promise of God, has fallen to the ground without fulfillment, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children that are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac shall your seed be called. That is, those who are of the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not being yet born, nor having done any good or evil, in order that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. Now, Paul does not immediately jump into the subject of Israel's rejection. He wants them to understand that he has great compassion for them and has no personal animus against them whatsoever. It is not as if Though they hated him, and they clearly did, because of his proclamation of the gospel to the Gentiles, it is not as though he hated them, uh, but had great compassion for them and continual sorrow in his heart because of their blinded condition due to their own personal unbelief and rejection of God's Messiah. And so Paul is here expressing his deep concern for their spiritual condition. Now, the first thing this teaches us is that this passage is clearly talking not about some external privilege, but it is talking about the whole matter of Israel's salvation and the salvation of people from among the Gentiles as well. And that's going to be clear as we continue to look at the passage. Paul is not talking about some extraneous issue that has nothing to do with with the saving mercy of God toward his elect people. Very clear, because in the first place, would Paul have said that he was at the point of wishing that he himself could be accursed from Christ and cut off from all the blessings of God and therefore become not only unrighteous but also unholy? If Paul had been talking about something other and of something something of lesser importance than eternal salvation. I think it's very clear that Paul is talking here about uh, the whole idea of God saving sinners. And so Paul is deeply disturbed and deeply burdened over his people. Uh, At the beginning of the very next chapter, Paul says, "Uh, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And he's not talking about some physical deliverance, but he's talking about deliverance from the wrath of God. He's talking about deliverance into the eternal kingdom. And so I think it's, uh, it, it's probably, it should be at least uh, beyond controversy that Paul is talking in this entire passage about uh, the salvation of the Gentiles that God has sovereignly determined to accomplish as he has prophesied that he's going to do. But in this passage, what Paul is doing is he's, he's simply addressing these people and expressing uh, concerning them his deep uh, emotional uh, concern uh, 
for their well-being. Now, one of the things this teaches us, as we're going to see, the passage is clearly talking about God's sovereign right to save whom he will and pass over whom he will without doing injustice to anyone. Um, I think it's important that we understand that though that is clearly set forth in this passage, there is no contradiction between believing that God is in absolute sovereign control of every aspect of our lives and acting and living according to God's revealed will and feeling what we feel, uh, not in terms of God's decree, uh, but in terms of the kind of compassion that we are um, instructed in the scriptures to have for those who are lost. It's in the book of Jude that we are told that we are to have compassion on those who are perishing. We are to snatch them out of, out of the fire, uh, having compassion for them. And so we are to act not in terms of the sovereignty of God and be cold and calculated and say, well, if, if it's God's will to save them, then he's going to save them. And if it isn't, then he's not going to save them. And that should not have any emotional effect on us whatsoever. No, we are instructed in the scriptures to have great compassion for people, just as God has compassion for people as his creatures. God is not a compassionless God. And we must never allow our view of the sovereignty of God and the salvation of sinners affect our view of God's love and compassion and long-suffering and, and mercy and grace that is extended to sinners in the proclamation of the gospel. Those two things are not contradictory. And, and, and we must hold those two ideas in tension as we look at passages like this. If we don't, then we're going to become cold and callous in our approach to in the matter of evangelism and in the matter of Christian living and in every other aspect of our lives if we fail to understand that the sovereignty of God and what God has decided is not our rule of practice. Our rule of practice, of course, is the revealed will of God in the Holy Scriptures. And so there is no contradiction whatsoever between Paul believing firmly in the sovereignty of God and the salvation of sinners and his feeling a continual sorrow in his heart because of the ungodly rejection of the Lord's Messiah by his countrymen. And so Paul says, I, I, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. This is not tautology. Paul is not unnecessarily repeating the same idea, but this is a, a Hebrew way of expressing uh, one idea. I am telling you the truth. I'm, I'm telling you the truth in Christ. Uh, my conscience is also bearing witness uh, in the Holy Spirit, in other words, Paul is conscious of the fact that he is writing here under inspiration and is telling the truth concerning his feelings about Israel, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed for, from Christ. Now, please notice that Paul does not say that he does wish to be uh, accursed from Christ for his brethren, according to the... Uh, according to the flesh. He is merely saying, in effect, if that were proper and possible, I would be willing to perish for the sake of my brothers. But this is not something that is proper and is not something that is possible. Um, Charles Hodge makes some interesting comments. He, he says this, if it is wrong to do evil so that good may come, how can it be right to wish to be evil, and that would be indeed what Paul would be wishing if he were wishing to be uh, uh, cut off from Christ, a curse from Christ for the sake of his brethren, that is under uh, God's condemnation for the sake of his brethren. Um, how, if, if it's wrong to do good, uh, do evil that good may come, how can it be wrong to be, how can it be right to be evil so that good may come? Then he says this, can one love God so much that he wishes to hate him? And indeed, that would be the situation if Paul were cut off from Christ and if Paul were not 
in the spirit, but in the flesh, he would be hostile toward God. And so can one love God so much as to wish to hate him? Can he be so good as to, as to desire to be bad? And then, and then Hodge says this, we must be willing to give up houses and lands and parents and brethren and our life also for Christ and his kingdom. But we are never required to give up holiness for his sake. For this would be a contradiction. And so what Paul is saying here is, if it were possible and proper, I would be willing to be a curse from Christ and cut off from him and under condemnation so that my brethren might be saved. Um, Now, Paul then begins to talk about the privileges that the Israelites, that is, that is his countrymen, according to the flesh, have enjoyed. And, and they are numerous. Listen to what Paul says. Um, they are Israelites. That is, they are descendants from Jacob or from Israel. Uh, to them pertains the adoption. They are referred to as the sons of God. Out of Egypt have I called my son. And they have been granted an inheritance in the land of Canaan. To them belongs the glory. He's no doubt referring to the dwelling glory or the Shekinah glory that dwelt in the tabernacle and in the temple during the old covenant period. And to them belong the covenants. There is the covenant that is made with Abraham. There is the covenant that is made with Israel at Mount Sinai. Um, And so to them belong the covenants and the giving of the law. Other nations were allowed to walk in their ignorance and in their blindness, and Israel was given a clear uh, declaration of the revealed will of God in the law given to them at Mount Sinai. There was no question about how they ought to live. They knew directly from the hand of God how they ought to conduct themselves. And to them was given the service, the liturgical service of of Israel's cult, Israel's worship. uh, That was given to them and to no other nation. Other nations might worship their idols, but Israel could not continue in idol worship because God had commanded them to have no other gods before him. And then to them belong the promises of whom are the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, are the the fathers. They are the patriarchs of these people that Paul calls his countrymen according to the flesh. That is, those who are born uh, in terms of their natural born, uh, their natural birth as Israelites. And then he says, according to, uh, um, or not only from them, are, are the, are, of them are the fathers, but from whom, according to the flesh, that is, in terms of his human nature, um, Christ came. Uh, And uh, in other words, he's saying, this one who came from them, this Messiah, who was born of the nation of Israel, this one is a true human being. He is as much man as if he had not been God. And then he says concerning him, Who is over all? Now, the question we have to ask is, who is over all? Is there any other who is described in scriptures as over all besides God himself? And the answer is, only God himself can be over all. He is the most high. And this is then ascribed to the Lord Jesus here. So it's very clear that Paul is saying not only was he as much man as if he had not been God, he is saying he is as much God as if he had not been man. He was very God of very God, very man of very man. And then Paul writes, the eternally blessed God, amen. And so what Paul is doing here is he's, he's giving his brethren, uh, at least attempting to do so, he is, he is giving them the confidence that he is not against them. He is one who has great compassion for them, great heaviness and continual sorrow in his heart because of their own rebellion against God. Now, in verse, in verse um, 6 of this chapter, Paul introduces to us the subject, I think, of the next three chapters, chapters 9, 10, and 11. 
And that has to do with this objection that Paul, although not formally introducing, seems to be implying, and that is, Paul, are you, are you not cognizant of the fact that God made promises to Israel, that God seems to have, a, have, a, have had a purpose for Israel, and, and yet you have taught us in chapter 8 that God's purpose is going to be fulfilled. The certainty of our um, glorification is rest on God's purpose, the fact that God has determined that he is going to bring us all the way to glory. But then what about Israel? Have God's promises to Israel fallen to the ground without fulfillment? Uh, Is God now unfaithful to his promise? Listen to what he says in verse 6. But it is not as if the word of God has taken no effect. That is, it is not as though the word of God has fallen to the ground without being fulfilled. And the first argument that he makes is that not everyone who is the descendant of Israel or Jacob or not everyone who belongs to the nation of Israel is a true Israelite. And this must control our thinking as we consider the entirety of Romans 9 through 11. Because Paul is here describing and defining for us what he means when he talks about the Israel of God. Who is Israel? Now, one of the things that is not taught here, although I think it's taught other places, is that everyone who is a true believer is a true Israelite. That's not what Paul is teaching in this verse. What Paul is teaching in this verse is that everyone who is an an Israelite by natural birth is not a true Israelite. And those are two different aspects of the same truth, I think. But Paul is here saying, just because you descended from Jacob or from Israel, or just because you are part of the nation of Israel does not mean that you are a true Israelite. Now, this wasn't a a distinction that was new with the Apostle Paul. The Lord Jesus himself made the same distinction. You may recall that that in um, John chapter 8 and verse 37, Jesus had said to these people who had believed on him, keep in mind that when John uh, uses the aorist tense to describe faith, he's usually talking about an historic faith and not a true saving faith. He usually reserves the present tense. That is, it's an ongoing, it's a durative uh, thing, this faith that is, is justifying in nature. But here he uses, um, here, here, here John uses the, the aorist tense, that is the past tense, that's something that has occurred, um, point action. And uh, he says, uh, he's speaking these things to those who believed or who had believed on him. And Jesus said to them, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. If you continue in my word, in other words, true disciples are going to continue. True disciples are not going to make a one-time decision when God somehow, or they themselves, bring themselves to the point that they, they are at a point of, um, of um, understanding and consciousness, and so they um, make this decision, maybe at the end of a, an evangelistic meeting, and, and then they go out and pretty much forget what has happened, And um, there is no continuance in his word. Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. And that, um, you know, that leads them um, to say, wait wait a second, we're Abraham's children. We were never in bondage to anyone. And Jesus says in verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. He does not deny that these people are descended from Abraham. But then in verse 39, Jesus says, If Abraham were your father, or if you were Abraham's children, then you would do what Abraham did. In other words, Jesus is saying, In one sense, I know you are Abraham's Uh, descendants, but in another sense, I know you are not Abraham's children, because if you were Abraham's children in the spiritual sense, then you would do what Abraham did. Um, We see 
this, this, this claim to being Abraham's children set forth in Luke chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Um, John the Baptist is uh, exhorting people to repentance, and he says to them, don't even think about saying to me, we have Abraham as our father, because God is able to raise up from these stones children to Abraham. Now, what in the world was he saying? I think he's possibly saying, do you not remember what we read in Ezekiel chapter 36 about the stony heart and what God is able to do with the stony heart? In other, in other words, he doesn't say you are able. He says God is able to accomplish this work. And so this distinction is not a new thing. Um, we read in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 29. In fact, let me just turn there and read the passage. Galatians 4 and 29. Keep in mind that Paul has introduced the idea that Hagar is a, a, a type. Uh, he uses um, another term, but I think rather than allegory, a type or analogy would be a better idea. Um, Hagar was a type of the old covenant, and Sarah is a type of the new covenant, and her children are a type and shadow of the new covenant people of God. Um, and so we read in, in verse 29 of, uh, of Galatians chapter 4, Now we, brethren, this is verse 28, we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. This is the distinction that Paul is making in Romans chapter 9. We, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh, that is, according to the natural order, there was nothing supernatural about what happened in the birth of Ishmael, as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, that is, he was not born according to the natural order, but he was born supernaturally. It was something that normally would not have occurred. Abraham was too old and Sarah was too old, and yet God came and intervened and caused this to occur. And then he says, even so it is now, that is, those who are born according to the natural order are persecuting those who are, listen to it, born according to the supernatural order, born of the Spirit. Now, that doesn't happen because you do something in the natural realm that causes a spiritual reaction. And we're going to see that set forth really in the passage before us. It's very clear that what Paul is teaching in this passage is that those who are truly the, the sons of Israel are those who have been born spiritually. I think in a, in a sense we have misunderstood or at least ignored some things in, in John chapter 3 when Jesus says to Nicodemus who comes to him by night and says to him, Master, we know that you're a teacher come from God because no one could be doing these signs that you're doing unless God was with him. And Jesus says to him, Nicodemus, you need to be born from above. You're talking about the old creation. You're talking about term, the terms of the old covenant. You're talking about being a part of the kingdom of God as it was manifested in the history of Israel. But things have changed. This, this is a, a new ball game. You need to be born from above. And this, I think, harks back to verse 13 of, of chapter 1. In verse 12, we are told that to as many as received him, to them gave he the authority to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name, who were born not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. In other words, those who believe the gospel are those who have been born from above. This is how a person is introduced into this new creation, into this new covenant community. It is not by being born physically, although there are those who will uh, tell us that um, children of believing parents become covenant children. 
these verses are very clearly telling us that those who are born of uh, believing parents are not naturally born, but they must be spiritually born to be part of the kingdom. You need to be born from above, and that doesn't happen by your physical birth. And so I think Paul is saying in this passage, look, you people are trusting in your uh, your physical lineage. You're trusting in the idea that somehow the promise of God is made to all of Abraham's physical descendants. But the promise of God was never intended for all of Abraham's physical descendants. The promise of God was made to those who are born from above, those who are born spiritually. <clears throat> and that's what Paul, I think, is is pressing home to us in this passage. They are not all Israel who belong to the nation of Israel. They are not all Israel who are descendants from this man who was named Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, one who contends with God or a prince with God. That doesn't happen. The promise of God doesn't come to us by natural lineage. The promise of God comes to us by spiritual regeneration. And so that's the first part of the argument. Now, he illustrates that as he goes on in Romans chapter 9 by talking about the seed of Abraham, that is the offspring of Abraham. And he says not everyone who is Abraham's offspring is heir to the promise. Listen to what he says here in chapter 9. Um, in chapter 9, verse 7, Nor are they all children because they are are of the seed of Abraham, because they are the descendants of Abraham. But in Isaac shall your seed be called, God says to Abraham. God, your seed is not going to be Ishmael. Your seed is going to be Isaac. It is in Isaac that the blessing is going to come. This is going to be the lineage that I intend to bless, not that which you have contrived by your own doing to to try to bring about my purpose, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. Listen, listen to what he goes on to say. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. That is, those who are produced by normal and natural means, are not the children of God, but the children of God are those who are produced by supernatural means. That is, it is the work of God and not our own work that brings us into the kingdom. That is, those who are children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise. These are counted as the seed. For this, listen to it, this is the word of promise. At that time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. What does that, what's the significance of that? At, at that time I will come. Well, when we read about God coming, the idea is that God comes in a supernatural and powerful way to accomplish his purpose. This birth would never have taken place had not God arrived, had not God manifested his supernatural power and brought about that which was impossible in the realm of the flesh. And so at that time, I will come, I'm going to act, and Sarah shall have a son. Abraham could not produce this himself. It was not normal. It was not natural. It was indeed impossible. And so Yahweh says, at that time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And then, and then we read, and not only this. And I think Paul wants to put a, a finer point on his argument because he recognizes that, well, yes, God may have rejected Ishmael because he was the son of the bondwoman, and he may have received Isaac because he was the son of the free woman, 
And so there was no real sovereign activity there, although if you think about, and we've mentioned it in our last video, if you think about it, Abraham, or Abram at the time, was called out of the land of the Ur of Chaldees, uh, and that was a sovereign action on the part of God. God did not choose everyone from that pagan land and make promises to them. God acted sovereignly in that choice. God acted sovereignly in choosing, and because he had decided to bring it about, in choosing uh, Isaac in place of Ishmael. In spite of what Abraham was trying to do by his own natural means, God said, okay, this is my purpose. I'm going to come, and Sarah shall have a son, and he is going to be the promised seed. But if someone wants to argue against that, Paul says, okay, think about this. It's like he's, he's doubling down on this doctrine that he's teaching here in Romans chapter 9. Verse 10, and not only this, but when Rebekah had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, in whom the seed would be called, and then he says, for the children not being yet born, nor having any good or evil, having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calls, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. What is he, what's that talking about? Well, it's not talking about the whole of their life. It's talking about the fact that it was not Esau who um, received the blessing from his father, but it was Jacob. Jacob was not the one who should have had the birthright, but his brother wound up serving him by giving him his birthright in a moment of hunger and being famished. He said, wow, you know, this soup is better than my birthright. And so he hands it over. And then through his chicanery, <laughs> Jacob um, makes certain that his, he, he was the one who was blessed and not his brother. So the elder winds up in this sense serving the younger. And then we read, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. In other words, God used the wickedness, the deceitfulness of, of not only of Jacob, but also of his mother, in reality, to bring about his own purpose in Jacob being the chosen seed and instead of his brother Esau. Now, when we see this quoted in the book of Malachi, of course, it's, it's talking not merely about these two individuals, but it's talking about the nations that have come from them. But the whole point is God chose one individual over another in order that he might choose one nation over other nations. Now, keep in mind what we read back in Deuteronomy. I think it's important that we remember those words. At Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 7, and there Yahweh says, I did not set my love on you or choose you. And by the way, this really kind of fits into what we learned back in chapter 8 of Romans. Paul talks about God foreknowing or setting his love or his affection, his approval on his people. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Here in Deuteronomy, he says, um, I did not set my love on you. I did not set my affection on you or choose you because you were more in number than the other nations of the earth. For you were fewer than the other nations of the earth. But I loved you because I loved you. And I wanted to be faithful to the promise, to the covenant that I made with your fathers. And so, and so we see the pattern that is being established. And, and as we mentioned in our last video, what, what God has done throughout redemptive history is that God has established various patterns according to which he always works. And what Paul is teaching here is that there is a correspondence between the type, God choosing this nation of Israel, and the antitype, God choosing his new covenant people. 
And so rather than arguing, well, this is not talking about nations, it's talking about individuals. First of all, it is talking about individuals initially, and then it talks about nations. Uh, but rather than making a big deal over that, we could acknowledge, yes, it's talking about God choosing a people for himself. But what is the pattern that has been established in the way in which God has chosen that nation? You see, that's the point that Paul is making here in chapter 9 when he says, uh, in order, it, not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger. What's his purpose? And the answer is that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, when he talks about his purpose, he's talking about a determination of the will. This in itself expresses the idea of sovereignty. This is something God has decided to do. And the basis of that choice is in the divine mind and not in the objects chosen. God has purposed, we are told in Ephesians chapter 1, in himself. That means the purpose was not determined by anything outside of him, but the purpose was determined in himself. And so it's not in the, uh, the choices in the divine mind and not in the objects chosen. The choice in this case is made prior to birth in order that the true nature of the purpose of God in reference to that choice might appear. That is, when he says that the purpose of God according to election might stand, he means that the purpose of God as a pattern by which he always acts might be established and seen in its true character. This is the way God does things. The way God chose Israel was not to look at Israel and say, wow, what a wonderful people they are. Look how many there are of them. I think I'll choose them. No, I love them because I would love them. It was my choice. It was my sovereign purpose to do so. That is the pattern that is established. When he, when he loves Jacob and hates Esau, then he is doing so to establish a pattern. And so Paul says that the purpose of God according to election might be established, might stand. <clears throat> the elder shall serve the younger. In other words, God does not do things according to the natural order. He does not do things as we would like to think God does things, but God does things according to his own sovereign decree. And of course, this all feeds into the, to the question, how is it that God could have cast off his people Israel, the, the covenant people to whom belong the glory and the covenants and, and the, the, the service and all of the, the privileges? That it, how could God do that? And the answer is God can do that because he has the sovereign right to do it. And that's the whole point that Paul is making here. God has the right to save people from the Gentiles because the Jewish people had no right to claim his blessings to start with. They were sovereignly bestowed. It is not because God says, well, these people are going to be faithful because they weren't. Um, they are going to always be obedient to my law, and so I'm going to choose them as my special people. No, God knew altogether about them when he chose them. He knew how miserable they were going to be. They're going to be like a backsliding heifer. That is a heifer that, that's always backing away from the yoke of his law, not willing to do what he tells them to do. And so Paul says this, this establishes God's sovereign right to do what he will with his own creatures. The basis of the choice is not in those chosen. It is not based on anything that they will do or anything that they will decide or choose. It is based solely on the sovereign will, the sovereign purpose of God. It is on God who does the choosing. The hymn writer said, What was there in me that could merit esteem or could give the Creator delight? And then answer is, T'was even so, Father, we ever must sing, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Now, in our next video, we're going to take up the two objections that uh, 
seem always to be raised to Paul's argument in this passage in showing that God's de decree, God's purpose, God's choice is based not on what sinners do, but is based on his own sovereign will. And what are those objections? Well, the first objection is, well, if God has done that, that isn't fair. And the second objection is, if that's the way God has done things, how is he going to hold anyone responsible for our actions? Those are the two objections. Now, you need to decide on which side of that objection are you. Are you on Paul's side of the objection, or are you on the objector's side of the objection? If you make those objections to Paul's argument, then you are on the wrong side of the argument. You know, it, it pains me to say this, but I really, truly believe that the problem in understanding what Paul is teaching here is not an intellectual problem. I think Paul is very clear in saying, God, in choosing Jacob instead of choosing Esau, God has established his own sovereign pattern for the way he accomplishes his will. I, I don't think you can miss that. And if you bring up those two objections, then you are arguing on the wrong side of the issue. I think the problem is not intellectual at all. I think the problem is a, a problem of rebellion against the fact that God is in sovereign control of his entire creation. People simply don't like for God to be in control. And if you believe in a God who has relinquished the control of his universe to the libertarian free will of the creature so that the, the inmates are running the asylum, then you don't believe in the God of the Bible. You believe in a false deity. And if you dislike the God that I'm talking to you about, then in reality you are acting in hostility against God and you are giving evidence that you are in the flesh, that is, you are lost, and you are not in the Spirit. I hope you'll let that sink in. Don't reject what God has revealed about himself. If these were my ideas, then I can say you can, you can reject them with impunity. No problem. But these are not my ideas. I'm, t I'm simply telling you what the text says. God has chosen to bless Jacob and he has chosen not to bless Esau for the purpose of establishing a pattern by which he also chooses his spiritual seed. That's clearly what the passage is saying. If you ignore that, you are, you are simply ignoring the plain teaching of the scriptures. And if you object, as the objector here objects, then you are on the wrong side of the argument. Well, we're going to look at those two objections next time. We'll possibly come back and look at some other issues here. But we're going to look at those two objections and um, see how Paul very clearly answers them in the context of this passage. Well, I hope this has been helpful to you. If you have questions or comments or objections, feel free to leave those in the comment section. If you like the video, please click like, share the video. Uh, subscribe to the channel so you'll be uh, advised when we have a new video up. And until next time, may God richly bless you.